have you here on this glorious Sunday morning, and I want to introduce you to a very special friend who is connected to this church in a lot of different ways. Her husband is involved in the men's Bible study, and she is the U.S. representative for a marvelous ministry that we have supported and have been told time and time again that we are the American church, the only American church, that supports Arian Harriet, who does the ministry of La Pelicane in Afghanistan. So Nancy Newbrander, come on up and give us an update on what's going on in Afghanistan and with Arian. It's so good to have you here. Well, it's wonderful to be here. And um, as uh, Pastor Ted mentioned, your church was the very first church in America to take on the regular support of La Pelican. And even this morning, Arian texted me and said, please express my deep gratitude to that church. It just means the world uh, to have your support. As you may know, uh, La Pelican is a ministry to poor and special needs children in uh, a very poor part of Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, it was started in 2003 by a couple from France, Jacques and Ariane Hiriart. And they, uh, at one time, did not know Jesus. They were um, in France. They had a bakery and unfortunately lost their only son to leukemia at age 10. That loss drove them almost to suicide, but a desperate search led them to find Jesus. And as a result, they sold their bakery and decided to move to a country where they could serve uh, needy children. Uh, Ariane has written that story in a book called From Colmar to Kabul. And I believe it's in your library, <laughs> or it's available on um, Amazon. It's a wonderful story uh, to read how that transformation happened. La Pelican seeks to serve very poor children. These are children that are too poor even to go to school. Many of them are working children. They work on the streets. They beg. They clean shoes. Uh, they do anything to earn a few coins. Uh, the, the center provides uh, a daily hot meal. It provides basic education and vocational training and recreational activities. About 10 years ago, La Pelican added a program for deaf children uh, where they are learning sign language and pursuing an education in sign language. And then just two years ago, they added a program for special needs children. Uh, children with uh, autism, Down syndrome, uh, other forms of trauma for whom nothing is done in Afghanistan. So that is the latest addition. <clears throat> Today about 400 children come every day uh, and they're served by Ariane and 51 Afghan employees as well as her newest colleague, a woman from uh, Peru whose name is Graciela. So together, they uh, serve these children uh, day in, day out. I came to know about La Pelican in the early 2000s when Bill, my husband, and I were living and working in Afghanistan. And we got to know Jacques and Ariane through the Fellowship of Believers who were there. And uh, I had the privilege of getting involved and even teaching some classes there. When we left, Jacques and Ariane asked what, if I would represent La Pelican in North America. And so, of course, I gladly accepted that, and that has been my role ever since. <clears throat> As all of us are aware, Afghanistan experienced a tragedy in 2021 when the Taliban took, retook power after 20 years of increasing freedom and help from the West. That all came to a a close in 2021. Most international organizations closed their work and left. Uh, even La Pelican closed for four months. And during that time, the uh, center, La Pelican Center, was robbed of everything of value and uh, ransacked by thieves who claimed they were Taliban. But despite that, in January of 2022, Ariane returned. Uh, her husband, Jacques, had passed away in 2013 from esophageal cancer. 
but she went back and in 2022 reopened uh, the center under the Taliban. And uh, that does not mean that they have not interfered. They come all the time, surprise visits. Even yesterday, they had a visit from the Taliban secret police. So they've had to adjust how they do their work. Uh, they used to have co-ed classes, but now the boys come in the morning and end their classes with lunch, and the girls start with lunch and end their classes in the afternoon. They also had to get male teachers for the boys and female teachers for the girls. But despite all of that, despite all the visits, uh, they're still operating uh, with the the blessing, of, I guess I'd say the blessing of the Taliban. <laughs> it's very uncertain because they, they, anything they see that goes against their ideas, they're very quick to point that out. So we're, uh, the people at La Pelican are always on high alert about that. Uh, on this Mother's Day, we know how deep a mother's love for her children is. And one of my favorite um, memories of La Pelican is actually a video that Ariane talk, took the first day that they welcome special needs children. Um, she was videoing the children as they came into this colorful, comfortable classroom with games and toys and uh, decorations on the wall. And then she panned to the window and there were the mothers looking in the window at their children, uh, just beaming to see these precious children of theirs loved and attended to. Because in Afghanistan, special needs children are considered a curse and it's a dictate that they should be hidden away. But at La Pelican, they are welcomed and honored. And so that memory uh, thrills me and, and that, uh, is the message of La Pelican showing the love in the name of Jesus. Because of strict Taliban rules, they can't teach about Jesus, but they can show the love of Christ. And I have no doubt that many, when they have the opportunity to learn more about Christ, will accept him because of the love they experience at La Pelican. Thank you so much. <laughs> Nance, hold on a second. We want to pray for you and for, for Ariane as well. Thank you. Yeah. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we do thank you that you call us into service and that there are individuals that you set apart to go into places that really are tenuous. And so, Lord, we, we pray that you would surround the Pelican by your angels as you have over the years. Continue to minister through Ariane and her efforts as she trains up the next generation of leadership. Lord, you are an awesome God, and we pray that you would be with Nancy as she continues to transmit the great news of your truth through the people here in the U.S. about what's going on in that country of Afghanistan that so dearly needs your love to be made known. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, let us now prepare our hearts and minds for a rich encounter with the risen Savior, Jesus Christ.
as we call ourselves to worship from Psalm 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. gathered here in worship, it's easy to have our focus be on God and be able to sing praise and give Him glory. But if we're honest with ourselves, when we're not here in worship, we sometimes miss that mark. We do things we shouldn't do or don't do some of the things that we should do. We can see the brokenness in our world as we look at some of the relationships that are around us. And we're found guilty. But in that unfaithfulness, God is faithful. And we're reminded in Scripture that just like a mother hen gathers the chicks under her wing, God gathers us and welcomes us back, giving us a chance to live anew 
and in that forgiveness. And so with that knowledge, let us boldly confess our sins before God, knowing that we receive mercy and grace. Join now in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this Mother's Day, we recognize that you have called us into relationship with one another and with you. Our first and most compelling experience of love was imprinted upon us as a baby. For some, it was as you intended. For others, the pain was etched a deep scar. We gather scars as we mend through life whether self-inflicted or carelessly inflicted upon us others. We long for a mom to kiss these wounds to make them better, but we know only the wounded healer, your son, can bring us relief. Lord, we pray for forgiveness for our brazen acts that have hurt others and your creation. We pray for your forgiveness for our soul and demeanor that distances us from your love. Fill us with your love, which inspires us to be better mothers, fathers, children, and friends. We pray all this through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for you. Christ rose for you. Christ reigns in power for you, and Christ prays for you. Anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. My friends, be at peace, and know that you are forgiven. Our Old Testament lesson for this morning comes from one of our major prophets, Isaiah. And we are looking at Isaiah chapter 8, verse 2. 11, all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 22. Let us now listen to the word of the Lord as it's recorded here in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11 through 22. The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. He said, Do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And he will be a sanctuary. But for both houses of Israel... He will be a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble, they will fall and be broken, they will be snared and captured. Bind up the testimony and seal up the law among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Here am I, and the children of the Lord has given me. We are the signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God, why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to his word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Oh, that's a beautiful rendition of that hymn. And now, man, to tell you, Ray, that is fantastic having that trumpet coming in there, giving a, a little added punch to the song. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we continue our journey through 1 John. And boy, oh boy, it just keeps getting better as we turn to 1 John chapter 5. And we're looking at verses 6 through 12. Here now, God's truth is captured here in 1 John chapter 5. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for there is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is the word of the Lord, my friend. Thanks be to God. Let's do some praying. Merciful Savior, God of all hope, the one who calls us into an encounter with you that inspires us to step out into the world. We pray even now that your spirit will be present here to inspire us that the words of my mouth and the meditations upon our hearts will be made acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, happy Mother's Day, folks. And here's the reality. I'm just curious, who amongst us has not stood before the court of mom? I'm telling you what, that is a day in which your life is hanging in the balance. All time stands still as you stand before the court of mom. Now, let me get the record straight. I really love my mom. My mom, I think, was the coolest mom. Now, there are a few of you out there that I believe would give mom a run for the money. But, uh, yeah, she was awesome. Everybody loved mom. But I'm telling you what, if you tip the scales a little too far in one direction, you were looking right into the eyes of justice, and it wasn't a good day. That's all I'm saying. Whether it was a solo encounter or she was doing mediation between the siblings, she was going to find out what was the truth. And you were going to have to bear testimony to what that truth is. And mom was going to iron it out, baby. <laughs> no, no doubt about it. And somewhere along the way, in the midst of all of that, there would be the final declaration. If so-and-so were to jump off the bridge, would you too? And that pretty much summed up the court right there. And on we would go into the rest of what our lives would be. Today, we step into our text, and it's a beautiful thing as we see what is happening here with a testimony. Where is the truth? And the question at hand is, who is Jesus, is he the Christ? Hmm. The thing that's fun about this text is that John is doing a full recapitulation of his letter to this dear church that many scholars believe is the one that gathers in Ephesus. And Ephesus, as we know, has had quite a storied existence. The church itself has had a storied existence. All of Asia Minor were recipients of this letter, 
But if you were to go through the book of Acts, you would see what it is that the church of Ephesus was up against. You'll see that there was a riot that took place because of Paul preaching in Ephesus and the silversmiths getting all upset and their knickers in a wad. You would see that there were those Jews, the Hellenistic Jews that were coming in and causing pressure for the Christian church. There were those who were saying that the traditions of the Jewish lifestyle needed to be upheld and all the questions that were there. Oh, yes, it was a tenuous place. And here John is trying to help this dear church to understand who is Jesus? Is he really the Messiah? Well, we go all the way back to chapter 1. And we look at verse 1, because this is where John sets the bar. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. He starts out with this declaration. And then later on, he goes in the rest of his letter, as John is even compiling it all in this final chapter, in, in chapter 4, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. You see, where Ephesus was, it was a commercial headquarters. Trade was coming in and out of that town like nobody's business and all kinds of different types of worship and goddess worship was taking place. Chief among them was Artemis. It created a real tension. And so what does, Paul, or what does uh, John do as he speaks to this dear church in Asia Minor that's hearing this message and reassuring for them that Jesus is the Christ. So he takes on the Jewish history, and he says, okay, let's talk about that. If the Jews are denying that Jesus is the Christ, then let's take a peek at how it is that they weigh the evidence, that they stand before the court and give their defense. He says, there's the water, and there's the blood. Oh, now that hits core for the Jews because the blood and the water are tied into their very chief existence of their freedom that harkens back to a deep memory of God's deliverance for them. As you remember, they painted blood on the lentil for the Passover. And just a few weeks back, we just celebrated Easter, which happened right around Passover. And as they were making their way out into the wilderness, they came upon the Red Sea and they thought that it was all over. Their backs were up against the water. But it was God who brought them deliverance and divided the sea and brought them through the water. And that became their testimony. The blood and the water became the testimony of where God was at work in their lives. And nothing can erase that memory. And John comes and says, yes, the blood and the water. That's absolutely right. Because when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, what is it that we heard? But the voice of God said, saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You will listen to him. And then the blood of the, on the cross and Jesus' triumph over the grave. And even just a few days ago, we recognize the ascension and marvelous pick of that first hymn as we talk about the ascension of Christ into the right hand of God the Father. And there the angels look down at those disciples, including John, saying, what are you doing sticking around here for? still looking up into the heavens. This Christ that you saw will come again just as he left. Go and wait for the Spirit. And sure enough, even as next week we'll celebrate Pentecost, the Spirit of God came down on them and gave them the power to be able to testify to what it is that God is doing and how he's at work. 
past. So not only do we have the water and the blood, but now we have the Spirit. These three agree, as John writes. And when we turn back to Deuteronomy 19, we see what is the stipulation for a judicial court to verify whether or not something is true on the stance of two or three witnesses. And John is writing, we have three witnesses right here that Jesus is the Christ. This is what we know. This is what we uphold. This is what we attest to. The testimony of God. And so, friends, we look at this and we start to think, wow, the heart of John is just like the heart of a mom. We look at our Old Testament lesson, and what is it that we see in Isaiah 8? We see in Isaiah 8 a plea from God to the people of Israel. A plea that says, you were caught in the ways of the world, my friends. This is dangerous. We look at our text in 1 John, we go back just one verse. And last week, dear old Graham Waybright, he did a fabulous job as he led, helped lead along with Ella, our worship service here. And in that, we came upon this text in verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? You see, the temptations that were coming in on the Ephesian church and those who were part of Asia Minor was very similar to that what was happening to the, to the believers and the followers of God in the ancient times of the Old Testament and even for us in the 21st century. I'll paint it out this way for you. That the church of the 21st century is like that kid that tries to get into the popular kid's party. You know that party. The party that's going on down the street and all the popular kids are there. I mean, everybody's there. And they all are going and they're hanging out and they're having this great time, yapping it all up and everything else is going on. And you catch wind of it. The church is like this. Ooh, I want to be a part of that. Oh, I want to be a part of that world. And so the church shows up and goes through the front door and everyone's like looking over their shoulder and thinking, what are you doing here? And the church all of a sudden starts trying to put on this look. Well, I'm cool like you. I want to be just like you. I'm super cool, see? I'm like this. I'm just kind of living into your world, right? But the church is a half a step behind the culture. It's trying to catch up with culture. And it looks like a fool. Because the church is not supposed to be with culture. We're counterculture. Not in an egregious way. Not in a way that's thumbing our nose at culture. But it's a reality to see that the culture is diseased. It's diseased with self-obsession. It's diseased with a hedonistic desire. And you go to those popular parties, and that's what you're seeing. Kids talking about themselves, inflating themselves, making themselves out to be better than they really are, and engaging in behaviors that you know are abusive because it's all self-desires being fulfilled. And there's the church trying to live into that world. This is what Isaiah is warning about. This is what John is warning about. This is what your mother warned you about as you stand before her and says, what are you doing out there? There's a huge desire to protect you from being able to destroy yourselves. That's why you stand before the court of mom. She sees the path that you're walking down and says, this is trouble. I'm pulling you out of that. 
John sees it and he sees the church is going into the path of destruction. And he's saying, get out of that. There is only one God. Jesus is the Messiah. Don't try to be cool like the world. We've got a message to share. A message of transformation. And it's such a powerful message of transformation that way back in the 4th century, it had this kind of impact that the leaders of the Roman Empire were looking in at the church, even though it was under massive persecution. The church was still reaching out to those who were the disenfranchised, to those who were rejected, the widows and the orphans, and loving on them. That wasn't the cultural way. That wasn't what the world did. Jesus is about sacrifice. Jesus is about laying down your life for somebody else. The world is about what can I get and what can I take from you? And all of a sudden, the Roman Empire is looking at that and saying, what is it with these people? We feed them to lions, we cut them in half, and yet they're still singing praises and they're still ministering to those in our society. They're showing love to one another. That's infectious. You want to know how infectious it is? You go to Acts chapter 10, and there's this amazing story. (laughs) There's Peter hanging out in Joppa. And Joppa is a pretty cool town. You know, it's still around today. It's on the coast of the Mediterranean. And there's Peter. He's hanging out with this dude. He's a leather worker, you know. (laughs) He's a tanner. (laughs) He's hanging out there, which is a whole other story, actually. And all of a sudden, God comes to him in a vision. And we know this story, you know, this sheet comes down, there's all kind of animals in there and all this jazz. And the Lord says to him, hey, get up, Peter, and kill and eat. And Peter's like, oh, no, I can't do that. You know, there's some unclean animals in there. And God says, don't you tell me what's clean and unclean. Get up there and start eating. <laughs> and it happens three times. It always takes three times for Peter. You ever notice that? Well, then... On the other side of town, actually in Caesarea, there is this guy. He is part of the Italian cohort. He's a full-blooded Roman, a leader in the military. I mean, he'd be like a colonel. The guy was top stars. And he's there with all his guys. And he's like a devout man trying to figure out where's truth. And all of a sudden, the Lord says to him, hey, you know what? There's this dude up in Joppa. You need to go get him. So he sends a couple emissaries up there and says, and knocks on the door. And Peter comes down and says, you know, I've been waiting for you guys. Yeah, I'm coming. (laughs) So the Lord spoke to me and said, I got to walk with you guys. So they walk down to Caesarea. And sure enough, there Cornelius has this massive entourage ready to hear what? Peter talk about how he's, enfolded himself and syncretized and everything else with society and culture and how cool he is and how he's able to get on TikTok and show some kind of sweet move? No. Peter comes and he tells them the truth. He says, let me tell you about Jesus. Bam! Because that's what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear the testimony. Don't be weaseling around. Give it to us straight. Basically, as what Cornelius said, to Peter. And Peter delivered the message of the gospel. And at the end, what was it? These Gentiles that saw this strange curiosity about the Christian church because of the way they were living said, I need to get, get to know what's going on here. And Peter says, Is there anything that's stopping these guys from being baptized? Because the Spirit of God had descended upon all of them and they became followers because the truth was told unabashedly and without shame. You see, friends, one scholar puts it this way. The inward witness is not a small voice speaking within, but it is the inbreaking of faith within the soul it is the testimony becoming the possession of faith 
It's not some little voice that's telling you something to do in your head. Oh, I'm going to listen to my chakra. Get that out of your head. When the Spirit of God starts to move and he's speaking to you, you're going to move. I remember when I became a Christian, it was amazing. I got into the car. I was 15 years old. My mom says, you're going to Bible study. I said, oh, Mom, I'm not going to Bible study. She goes, oh, yes, you are. And I get in the car and the Holy Spirit, bam, working me over in the back seat. Honestly, because I had all these thoughts going on in my head. Where were they coming from? The Holy Spirit was telling me all about camp and about what I experienced in camp and things that I saw my mom do and how her life was and my grandfather and all these people. It's all working out in my head. And I get to the Bible study, and what do you know? The preacher starts talking about the golden rule, and that hit me right between the eyes. I'm telling you what, right then and there, that was the Spirit of God at work. It was the inbreaking of faith within the soul. It wasn't some still small voice saying, ooh, Ted, you better get your life fixed up. No, that was the Spirit of God saying, Ted, let's go, brother. And that's what happens with us as well. When we encounter the truth, and when we speak it unabashedly, and we see the Spirit of God at work. You know, we go back to Isaiah, and the funny thing is, there in Isaiah 43, the Lord is talking to the people. And he says, you know what, folks? You are my witnesses. The church is going to die if we don't speak of how God has been at work in your life. If we're too busy trying to be that kid going to the cool kid party, you're going to look like a dweeb. And everyone's going to write you off as an idiot. But if you come with a conviction of spirit and talk about the love of Jesus Christ and reveal that in your life, all those cool kids are going to recognize the shallowness of that party. And they're going to come knocking on your door. And they're going to want to hear, how is it that it's transformed your life? I'm telling you, that's truth. And here we are. Psalm 80, once again, tells this marvelous story as it's captured by Asaph. And I just want to read a portion of that to you because it's such a cool psalm. It's one that we got to remember because here, you know, it's called To the Choir Master According to the Lilies. Huh, what do you know? If you want to talk about where to start with your testimony, you can talk about how God provides for you even more so than these lilies. And then he says, According to the lilies, a testimony. <laughs> and toward the end of this, in verse 18, he says, Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. <sighs> Friends, we go back to our text here in 1 John, and what is it that we see that's really fun and absolutely powerful? Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Isn't this what we desire? To be able to live our lives? Isn't that where the value is? So maybe the words of mom are right. Are you going to jump off the bridge just because so-and-so jumped off the bridge? I don't think so. You're going to stand firm on the rock that makes some people stumble but is a firm foundation of your testimony. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this day. And God, we even thank you that um, you know the unspoken prayers of our hearts and that your spirit can bring those things up to your throne even as we pray the prayer that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
and thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship as we get into this time of offering. And so we think about the ways that God has blessed us and we give back out of our time, our talent, and our treasure. you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we ask that you would use these gifts and our very lives so that people in this community and communities around the world would come to know the love you have for them. We pray this in your name, O Christ. Amen.
fail throughout all eternity because we bear witness to a great truth. We stand before the court of mom and we tell her everything that's going on. And all the while, we stand before the presence of God who says, I love you. So go out there and bear witness to that truth. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, let the people of God say, Amen.